Good evening, Homewood family. This is kind of strange, but um, it's good to be able to communicate with you tonight. And um, I trust you've had a good day. Enjoyed this beautiful weather. It's been a perfect day weather-wise. I wanted to share some things with you tonight about uh, what God's Word has to say about the issue at hand and our unrest and maybe uncertainty. I also want to share with you about our Bible study. We're going to talk about that first. And then we'll end on uh, some words of encouragement. So thank you for uh, checking in this evening. If you have any questions or any prayer concerns, um, please let me know. You can text me. You can send it via email. Um, hopefully, um, we'll be continuing to be in contact uh, one way or the other um, very often. So thank you for tuning in. And, uh, for watching and listening. So make sure you have your scripture with you. We've got several things I want to cover with you. Um, first of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about our prayer concerns that I did receive this week. Uh, I asked you this morning to pray for Miss Charlene Sloan, which is Miss Wileen's niece. She has had her surgery. She's come out of the surgery. She's doing really well. So we need to praise the Lord for that answer to prayer. She's doing good. And Miss Wileen says, thank you for all the prayers. And, and indeed, thank you for that. Also, remember Barbara Bryant as she's working in the midst of all this chaos and um, she needs our prayers and, and words of encouragement as well as the other ones that um, are caregivers and doctors and nurses and those who come in contact with, with this uh, every day. Um, continue to remember Jean and Pat Moore in your prayers as well as Sharon Muir and Mike and um, the rest of those that are in our congregation going through tough times uh, either jobs or finances, uh, health-wise, relationships. Uh, there's always those things that can, can get us down. I do want to let you know there's another praise, uh, and that's from JR and Leslie Pardue. Uh, JR came in the office today and, and gave me word that the doctors had cleared him of, of all the things that he was nervous about and scared about. He has, a, has an issue from uh, some past injuries on his spine, his spinal column. Um, that's causing him some twitching and different things. So continue to pray for him. But there's a huge answer to prayer that uh, it's none of the things that he was really concerned about or the doctors had maybe been concerned about at one time. So let's thank the Lord as often as we go to him with our request. I want to share something with you that came out of our devotional book today. This is for March 18th. And the title of it was Rest in Him. Interesting how the Lord's always on time. It says, come to me, all you who are, are labor, who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. When the interstate highway system began in 1956, commercial interest, gas stations, food stores, motels were not allowed except at exits. To provide access to facilities along the freeways, rest stops were built, but the rest provided was only temporary. One refreshed it once refreshed, it was back on the freeway again until the next rest stop. All of us need rest. So when Jesus invites us to come to him saying he will give us rest, exactly what kind of rest is he offering? Like the Samaritan woman who wanted to be cured permanently of thirst in John 4, 15. We might desire for Jesus to give us perpetual rest such that we never grow weary again. That would be nice. But that is not the rest Jesus offers us. His rest is the same rest described in Genesis 2, verses 2 through 3. God rested from his creating, not because he was tired, but because he had finished creating an environment in which he and mankind could fellowship together. Our union with God through Christ offers that same rest through renewed fellowship with God. That's a daily thing. Have you accepted Jesus' invitation to enjoy eternal rest in him? His spiritual rest is never ending and always available. And I wanted to share that with you because we get so restless and sometimes we get so anxious about life. We forget that our true rest, our source of peace and rest is in our Lord Jesus. On the way of encouragement before I lead you in prayer tonight, I wanted to share with you that uh, the stores are restocking. Um, Sonia went to the store Monday to IGA and Laura's and everything was there uh, except I think one item and she went back today and that item was there. Other stores have restocked at least once by now. So um, 
just keep that in mind, even though the shelves may be empty the time that you go, go the next day. If you can go in the mornings, uh, usually you'll find the shelves stocked a lot better than if you wait to evening or nighttime. Um, I want to encourage you to read God's Word more than you listen to the media. I know it's hard not to. We want to be up to date on what's going on, and we should be. But a steady diet of that will get you depressed and down. And you'll find yourself stressed and anxious. So have a steady diet of God's Word as you keep up to date with what's going on. Um, find time, make time for God's Holy Word. Also look for opportunities to serve and to minister. People all around us are anxious and stressed and worried. Folks, this is a golden opportunity for God's children, for the church to serve and minister. So look for those opportunities. And the last thing I wanted to share with you in, in that line is to demonstrate faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. It doesn't matter what the news says or what we see or what we hear or even what we experience. We walk by faith, not by sight. You and I have to demonstrate that and, and how we talk and how we walk and how we react and respond. So make sure we're about that. And God's word encourages us and commands us to live a life of faith. I want to pray with you. And then I want to start in our study for tonight and our prodigal son study on the realization and what that means. So let me pray with you. Father, I thank you that even though this is a different way that we have Bible study than normal, we can still come together as a body of Christ and your Holy Spirit binds us together. Lord, I thank you for sustaining us by your strength and your word and your presence. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. You're our strength and our source and our shelter. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of that. Not just so we can survive, but so we can thrive. Lord, help us to be people who walk the walk not just talk the talk. Help us to be people of faith, people who are active in serving and ministering and finding ways in our conversations to turn it toward you and toward life and peace and that rest that we've talked about already tonight. Lord, I pray that you would receive praise and glory from this Bible study tonight. I pray that you would be in the homes of each person that's listening and watching, Lord. I pray that your blessings would be on them and that they would feel the hedge of protection, as your word says, placed around them and their families. Not that life is always going to be a bed of roses or a smooth sailing, Lord, but that no matter what we go through, you're going through it with us. And it's by your strength that we come out on the other side, the victors. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, if you remember, our Bible studies on Wednesdays, we've been talking about the prodigal son and different things that he had gone through and um, different aspects of that, that journey. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the realization, which means when he was uh, in a foreign country and he found himself feeding the, the pigs and he knew that at home his dad had plenty of food and even the servants in his dad's home were well fed, he came to a realization of where he really was and what was going on in his life. If you have your scripture, if you'll turn back to Luke chapter 15, I want to walk through just a couple verses here in Luke 15, just as a reminder of what's going on. Now we're going to go to Luke 15, verse 14 and following. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of the country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. And this is our key verse for tonight, verse 17. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. He came to a realization, came to his senses of where he really was. And that's sometimes that's a hurdle that we don't always cross over very easily, is realizing where we are. That needs to be part of our prayers. God, show us where we truly are in our spiritual walk. Last week, we talked a little bit about God uh, putting eternity in the hearts of men. We found that in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Um, this week, we're going to take a look at what happens in the life of a Christian when they realize they are living in sin and disobedience. This realization is a first step on our journey back to the Father. This was the turning point for the prodigal son's life, when he realized where he was 
And he literally, at this point, um, repented, which means turn around from where we are toward our sin and turn toward God and go the direction back home to him. Um, I want to uh, encourage you to look at the video. It's uh, a little different than being here in the room together, but you can still see the video. I want to encourage you to do that. And then after we look at the video, there's a couple things we're going to go over. So listen carefully and watch carefully. We discussed in the previous session that sin by its very nature is deceiving. On the front end, sin almost always looks enticing, pleasurable, good, fun, and exciting. But the problem with sin is at the end of the day, it never delivers what it promises. And the prodigal son has just learned that lesson the hard way. Everything he thought that would bring him happiness has actually produced a pain and a misery he never could have imagined. And so what we're about to see is the pain and the suffering the prodigal is going to go through actually serves as a wake-up call to bring him back to the father that he never should have left in the first place. In Luke chapter 15, verse 17, Jesus said, But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here of hunger? Because our boy's in the pig pen. He's hurting, he's stinking, and he's sin sick. Remember the lie he believed at the beginning of the story? That there's a better life for me outside of my father's house? Well, sitting there in the slop of his sin, it hits him like a lightning bolt that he was dead wrong, that he's made a grave mistake. The young man had learned the hard way that life, in fact, was not better in the faraway land. Have you ever found yourself in a moment like that? If you're a Christian and you live long enough, you probably will. Maybe you looked at pornography because, hey, you were tired or bored or just plain curious. But afterwards, you were left with the stinging realization that your sin didn't deliver what it promised. Maybe you're being pressured by a boyfriend or a girlfriend to go farther sexually than you knew to be right. And in that moment, you thought to yourself, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of being thought of as, as a prude. I really don't think I want to do this. Only to find yourself afterward racked with guilt and shame and anger that could only come on the other side of being used. We've all been there in some capacity. And what I've come to realize over the years is that when it comes to his sons and his daughters, while God may let us take a trip to the faraway land, he never lets us stay there, not forever. The Apostle Paul wrote about the special grace of God in the midst of our sin. He wrote in Philippians 1, 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That verse is at once one of the most comforting and at the same time one of the scariest verses in all the Bible. Paul begins his statement like this. He says, I am confident of this. He essentially lets us know, hey, what I'm about to say, you can take to the bank. And then he continues by telling us that the same God who began the work of salvation in us will 100% absolutely positively finish the work he began in you until the day that he comes to take us home. In other words... God always finishes what he starts. And so from the moment of your salvation to the moment you breathe your last breath, God is dead set on keeping you near to him. I have found this verse to be absolutely true in my life. You see, every single time that I've walked down the path of sin, one of two things inevitably occurs. The first is that the Holy Spirit immediately begins to whisper, that's not who you are. You were not created for this. Turn around, come, come back home. And most times I listen. I heed the pleadings of the spirit that lives within me and I turn from my sin. But on the handful of occasions I ignored the whisperings of the Holy Spirit and I continue down the path of sin, God will bring discipline in my life, which inevitably leaves me with no option but to come back home. This has been my story every single time that I've walked in sin. Why? Because God promises that he will discipline those that he loves. And who does he love? He loves his sons and his daughters. So the only explanation I have for this dogged, never-ending, relentless pursuit of holiness in me is that I am his son. And he simply loves me too much to let me continue in my sin. You see, I grew up in a Christian home. I believe with all my heart that I was saved when I was about eight years old. But pretty much through high school, I didn't walk with the Lord. And when I 
went to college uh, the first semester at Texas A&M University. I didn't darken the doors of a church. Do a long story, a friend of mine began pursuing me, invited me to church, and finally one night I said I would. We went to a Bible study together in the middle of campus there at the university, and I walked um, in the door. <clears throat> I've been miserable for a long time, running from God, walking in sin. I walked into the chapel that night, and they were singing. They were singing a song that maybe you've heard before. The lyrics go like this, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares to you. And in that moment, I began to do something that I hadn't done in a really long time. I began to worship the Lord. And I remember saying something sort of in my mind and my heart when that happened. I, I said, God, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. You see, he pursued me, and he found me, and he brought me home. There's a story in the scripture that encompasses what I experienced that night. There was a period of time in Jesus' early ministry where he was extremely popular. He was being followed by thousands because he was feeding and healing them. And so everywhere he went, people wanted to be near him. Sensing the shallowness of their devotion, Jesus turned to the crowd and exclaimed, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. Well, the crowd of thousands who moments before had been following Jesus got offended, and they turned around and they walked away. Everybody left Jesus, everybody but the 12 disciples. And Jesus turned to them, and then he asked them a question. He said, are you going to leave me too? Well, Peter replied, Jesus, where are we going to go? For you alone have the words of life. And from that very moment in the chapel, in the middle of Texas A&M University in January of 1993, I found those words to be true. And trust me, I've tried it a thousand times and nothing, and I mean nothing, has given me a real sense of lasting joy and peace with the person of Jesus Christ and following him. If Jesus were to ask me if I was going to leave him, through experience, I know what I'd say. I'd say, Lord, where am I going to go? You alone have the words of life. I want to end this time by speaking to two groups of people. The first group of people I want to speak to are the ones of you that are still at home with your father, but you're thinking seriously about taking a trip to the faraway land of sin. Maybe you're wondering deep down inside in places you don't like to talk about, that maybe you're missing out on life's best by following Jesus. I can tell you from firsthand experience, those whispering questions are alive from the pit of hell. They are whispers from an enemy whose oldest trick in the book is to get you to doubt the promises of your heavenly father. And he's whispering them for one reason, to kill and to steal and to destroy. So you have a choice. You can believe the words of God or you can take that trip. But remember, at best, as a believer, you will be monumentally wasting your time. And at worst, you'll be making the greatest mistake of your life. Please remember that if you're his child, he will let you take the trip. There will always come a day when, like the prodigal son and me, you'll come to your senses and you'll come back home. But unfortunately, you'll come back home with pig stick on your clothes. It's simply not worth it. Jesus is asking you today, are you going to leave me too? I pray that your answer is, where am I going to go? Lord, you alone have the words of life. Lastly, I want to speak to those of you that are going through this study and are stuck in a pattern of sin. If that's you, I've got some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is that God will never leave you or forsake you. You might think he has, but I promise you he hasn't. That distance that you feel from God is not evidence of his absence. It's actually evidence of his patience. If there is sin in your life, God hasn't left you. He's simply waiting for you to come home. The promises of God are crystal clear. Your sin is not more powerful than the love he has for you as his child. He'll simply never give up on you, no matter what. If you're in a pattern of unrepentant sin, here's his promise to you. He will move heaven and earth to make sure he completes the work he began in you until the day of Christ Jesus. Sometimes that's really hard to believe. 
But in the coming pages of this study, we'll learn in full just how much he's been longing for your return. It's a lot to think about, a lot to consider. But remember, um, when we started this study, one of the things that I encouraged you to do was to see this as this pertaining to, to me personally. And you would say the same thing. Lord, how does this scripture, how does this teaching affect me? What does it say about me and my relationship with you and my walk? This is not for everybody else. This is for us personally. And we have to do some, some self-evaluation through the Holy Spirit and ask him to reveal to us what's present in our lives that could, could mean sin, could be sin, and keeping us from the Father. I wanted to read a couple things with you. If you want to join me, uh, we're going to go to Philippians first, and then we're going to go to John 16. But first, let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. And um, in verse 6, Philippians 1, 6. Uh, we'll find, let me just back up just a little bit to give you a little context here. Um, in verse 3, it says, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in, in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And the verse 6 says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And that's what Pastor Carter was saying, is that God is... If, if you belong to him, if you've begun the journey with him, he's going to continue to work in our lives. And he's going to put things in our lives that convict us of what we're doing. He's going to let the Holy Spirit do a work to, to show us that we have wandered far off and we need to come back. One of the things that I've become very convinced of uh, in the last several months and couple years is that the key to us being Christians and and spreading the gospel and making disciples it is not more knowledge, it's not more classes, it's not a lot of the things that we may think, but the key, in my opinion, is holiness. It's holiness and letting God do his work within us and staying close to him. And I've been convicted about that in my own life is that there is no way around that for us to be um, sincere and to be used of God as his children, as his vessels, we must live a life of holiness. And when we don't, it grieves the Lord, it grieves the Holy Spirit. So we have to ask for forgiveness and turn as the prodigal son did. And we see that today. He turned, he came to a realization of where he was and he comes back to the father. I also want you to look at John 16. If we, if we could go back to John chapter 16 and we're just going to read a couple verses, actually verses 7 through 10. John 16, verses 7 through 10. You'll find these words if you can follow along with me. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer be, behold me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So the Lord gives us a promise that the Holy Spirit is here to help us, to convict us, to come alongside. That's what paraclete means. The Holy Spirit is to come alongside and to show us when we need to turn. Sometimes the things in our lives may not seem like sin and we may not identify them as sin. It's not that bad because everybody else around us is involved in the same things. But if we look at God's word as the standard, not, not society or social media or anything else, but if we look at God's word as the standard, then we can truly see if we're walking in holiness, if we're being obedient to God, or if we're living a life of rebellion and sin. If you know Jesus and are wandering in the far off country of sin, the good news is that you will always come to your senses. God cares too much about his work in your life to let you continue in sin. 
When you are tempted to sin, the Spirit of God convicts and urges us towards reconciliation with our Father. Those are the words of Matt Carter in the book. And I would have to throw in here a warning. If you remember the children of Israel, the more they were involved in sin, the longer it took them to realize it and to ask for forgiveness. So don't get too comfortable with what I just read out of the book, that God's always going to convict you and bring you out and you're always going to choose to turn. The longer we stay in sin, the more comfortable we become in it. So let's pray that God will reveal to us anything in our lives that is short of holiness and that he will bring us out of that in his power and his strength and that we will be willing for him to do that. This week, as you, um, as you engage in your study in the book, you'll start on page 76 in, in your study guide here of the prodigal son. I want you to take note of Hebrews 12, verses 6, verse 6, Hebrews 12, 6. Uh, John 10.10, 10, John 10.10, 10, Hebrews 13.5. Those three verses, you'll find those uh, were mentioned in the, the video. Hebrews 12.6, John 10.10, 10, and Hebrews 13.5. I would encourage you to continue in your Bible study, your personal study. Uh, in your book, there's something to do each day. It takes us in God's Word and gets us uh, um, in depth. With, with his word and what it says. So please follow along with that. If you have any questions throughout the week, just text me and ask me. Um, if there's a passage I can help you with or if there's something I can help you look up, I'll be glad to do that. So thank you for continuing to study and spend time in God's word as we continue to look in this study of the prodigal son. During the video, Pastor Carter mentioned his experience and and with the Lord, and, and I want to share with you just some details at the end of his, of his story there. I don't know if you caught that, but a friend of his invited him to a Bible study on campus, and he went with his friend, and he talked about the song they were singing, uh, More Precious Than Silver. Um, and I want to read to you the last, the last part here um, in detail about what happened to him. He said, I think that uh, brings us to some important questions. What happened to me that night? Why the sudden change of heart? Was I simply caught up in the emotion of the moment? Was God for me on that night a crutch that a miserable young man was finally able to lean on? Yes, it was emotional. And yes, I desperately needed a crutch to prop up my tired, weary soul. But something deeper and more profound was occurring in me that night. And I want you to hear this. He says, I was a child of God hopelessly trapped in the chains of sin. But on that cold night in a small chapel in the middle of a college station, Texas, I came to my senses. I realized deep within my soul that the place I had found myself was a stinking, empty, and lifeless pig pen of, of my sin. I realized in that moment that the pig pen was not my home, and it never would be. God was my home, and it was time to return to Him. It's a great testimony, and you and I need to ask ourselves, does that speak of us? He says, I was a believer who was engaged in sin. Maybe that's something that you and I are dealing with today. We need to ask ourselves that. Folks, I'm going to change um, gears here just a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of unrest in our society and in our communities and, and jobs and, and different things. I want to address that quickly before I leave you here tonight. And um, remind you that God is in control. He is in 100% of this world. He, he knows what's going on. Nothing is shocking to him. And we have to depend on him. But there's a secret to this in our journey. And that's to live life in light of eternity. This place is temporary. And the Bible says that the afflictions that we have here are temporary. Just for a moment. And I'm going to read that to you. But... I want to read something out of a beautiful book that, that I've had for a while. Dr. Ken Nichols wrote the book called Masterpiece. And in the book, he addressed this issue that we are to live life in light of eternity. And I just want to read a little bit to you as a word of encouragement. Throughout the scriptures, God invites us to think, consider, reflect, and ponder the truth so that it sinks deep into our hearts and changes our attitudes and choices. Thinking of eternity isn't an easy escape from the troubles of this life. Instead, 
God's eternal promise gives us the courage to face painful realities with genuine hope. He assures us that our disappointments and heartaches today aren't the end of the story. Listen to this. No matter how bad things get, no matter how bad things get, God will have the last word. In a letter to the Corinthians, Paul explained how an internal perspective gives us courage to face today's difficulties. Please listen to God's holy word here taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, and, and the Bible says that, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He may not rescue us out of our suffering, but he promises to be with us every step through it. Our struggles may not make sense to us now, but we can trust in God's infinite wisdom and kindness. Trust in him. Every event, every encounter today is a brushstroke in the master's painting of our lives. Reflecting on the ultimate outcome gives us perspective to handle today's difficulties. If you knew you were going to receive millions tomorrow, wouldn't you worry less today? If you knew you were going to win an Academy Award tomorrow, wouldn't you handle criticism better today? If you knew you were going to move next door to your best friend tomorrow, couldn't you handle life's hassles a little bit better today? God's assurance is far greater than billions of dollars, awards, and time with a good friend. He promises supreme joy and fulfillment in the unfettered presence of God himself. A family feast that will bring the highest happiness and work more meaningful than we've ever imagined for all eternity. This assurance doesn't take away today's pain, but it gives us a bedrock of confidence that God will use our pain to produce something wonderful and meaningful if we'll trust him. Our new identity in Christ makes a difference in how we handle every situation, every situation. Folks, I want to share this with you in closing, and then I'm going to pray with you. I don't know how well you can see this, but this was something that Sonia and I got to do for Valentine's Day. We got to go to Conway Glass, and we made made something. This started out as just a, a, a piece of, uh, of glass, just a white piece of glass, a clear piece of glass. And there were some colored beads on the table. This, these beads were, were blue and neon green. And we put the rod inside this heated furnace, and the, the glass became um, gooey. It, it became almost a liquid form. And, and we turned it and we turned it and then we took it over to the table and we, we would dab it on those, those green and blue uh, little pieces of, of whatever they were, little pieces of glass, but they looked like little pellets. And we would dab it on there and then we would put it back in the furnace and we would turn it and we would come back out and dab some more and then we would turn it in the furnace and and then we put it in a mold, and we put it in the mold, and we took it back out, it came out in the shape of a heart. And after we filed it a little bit and sanded it down and we cut it off of the rod that we were turning, we left it there and we went to pick it up the next week. And this is the end result. It's a beautiful heart. It has the blue and the green swirls inside the glass. The only way that was possible is that the glass had to be heated up in a hot furnace. And there was a process where that glass was refined as it was heated up. And the end result is a beautiful piece of art, a beautiful heart. And I think about your life and my life, that God is the refiner. And Malachi talks about the refiner's fire. And folks, if you and I don't go through hard times, if we don't go into the furnace sometimes and experience some tough situations, then God isn't able to refine us the way that he wants to. It's through the tough times, it's through the heat, 
it, it's, it's through the trials and the distresses and the heartaches, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, that his strength shines through the brightest. So I just want to share that with you folks because when we get on the other end of this trial, this temporary light affliction, as the scripture says, we will be more equipped, better equipped, and more ready and motivated to be of eternal worth to God as he works in and through us, as he uses us as vessels in this dark, lost world. So I would encourage you, let's go out and walk by faith. Let's trust God in every step of the way. And let's show people around us that this life, this, this life is temporary and there's something much greater and eternal in the life to come. And that we're, we're in the hands of the Father, a loving God who knows everything and cares all about us. Let's continue to pray for those who are affected by the coronavirus as well as everything else with finances and jobs. And we, we have a, a local pastor and his wife there at uh, uh, Trinity United Methodist Church. He is, his wife is in the hospital and not doing well. I ask you to pray for her and, and family and pray for the church body. I pray that uh, you would continue to lift each other up here at Homewood. Let's lift our community up and, and find ways, look for opportunities to reach out and to minister to people. I want to close in prayer. I just thank you for listening and watching tonight. I'll be in touch with you before Sunday. If you have any questions or comments, text me, email me, or call. Um, and um, I just want you to know you're in my prayers. And um, we're held together by the Spirit and by God's love. So let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy word and thank you for the spirit. I thank you, Lord, that our strength comes from you. We don't have to depend on our knowledge, our experience, or um, our ability to figure it out. We just have to trust you. And Father, I pray that you would help us to do that. And, and again, not just to survive, not just to make it through, Lord, but to thrive to come through as victors and the, the, so that others can see you in our lives and they can look and see what is different about those people. Nothing seems to shake them. Lord, I pray that our faith would be that strong and your presence would be that real in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would, you would bless the homes of those that are listening and watching right now and, and you would give them your peace and your rest. In Jesus' name.